Talking about the individual, one of the things that I see holding people back is comfort. So it's easy to get life to a stage where it's not that bad, but it's not that good either. At least when you have a full-on breakdown, there's only one way to go, right? You're only going to go up from there. But I think it's possible to wallow for years in a just about passable life, right? Sedated by comfort. And I see this temptation in myself as well, to give up the good for the great. What would you say to people who are trying to escape this curse of mediocrity? Well, if you're satisfied with it in some fundamental sense, I mean, there's, there's something to be said, I suppose, for walling off a private space for yourself if you can maintain it and detaching yourself to some degree from the troubles of the world and maintaining your own little private garden. The problem with that is the snakes tend to seep in from the outside, right? It's, it's pretty difficult to wall yourself off in any real sense from the concerns of the world. So it isn't clear to me that that's a viable solution. It also means that you might justify to yourself lack of civic engagement. You know, I shouldn't go to church. I shouldn't take part in the political process because it's all so corrupt. I should hide myself from all the annoying uh, noise that's generated constantly on the media front. And I have some sympathy for that viewpoint, but I don't believe it's really possible because you can't have, you can't have a walled garden independent of, independently of the health of the broader society. It's just not possible. Maybe you can have it for a very short period of time. But, so, but if, you're, if you're comfortable with what you have and it, it's, gen, it's genuine comfort, then I think, okay, but generally it's not. I think for the most part, it's, it's people that have become sedated. You know, they've forgotten their dreams, but they've forgotten that they've forgotten them. Pink Floyd's Comfortably Numb mm-hmm. is about this, right? They've become comfortably numb. Mm-hmm. I think most people, so I, had, I have this friend and this, this story really hit me. So um, during the pandemic, running a podcast, I was able to have the thing that I feel I'm good at, my out- artistic pursuit and out- outlet, that was available for me to continue. It was actually increased because I didn't mm-hmm. have other stuff to do. Mm-hmm. And I have a friend that's a barber and he got a job at a supermarket. Barber's shut down for a long period of time and he got a job at a supermarket stacking shelves overnight. And I asked him, I was like, man, how are you, how are you finding the new job? It's a big, a big change. He's like, do you know what it is? I actually don't mind the work I don't mind the people that I work with, mm-hmm. but man, I miss being good at something. Right, right, right. Well, dude, that hit yeah, me yeah. so hard. Right. I missed being good at something. Yeah, yeah. Well, pe- people need the opportunity to be good at something. It, so then you might ask yourself, well, what's the best antidote to the discomfort of life? And you might say, well, it's comfort. And I suppose that's what you act out when you swaddle a baby. But a better antidote is something like adventure to excellence. And that's far better antidote to suffering than the mere absence of suffering. So not to say that the mere absence of suffering, that's not nothing, you know. Stepping out of that sedation from comforts, Mm -hmm. difficult though, especially if you've become routinized to it. Yeah, well, that's the difficult difficulty of maturity. You know, the Freudians said very wisely that the good mother necessarily fails. What does well, that mean? It means she stops providing the comfort that insulates people against the need for adventure. I heard you say recently that um, a mother's ability to let her child go out into the world, knowing that they're still vulnerable and that it's now that's down to them and the, the world to look after them, that's one of the bravest things that they can the do. It's the female crucifixion. That's so, and, and that's exemplified best in, well, the best portrayal of that I've seen is Michelangelo's Pieta. You know, it's, it's a statue of Mary, uh, and she has Christ's body on her, as an adult, on her lap, and yep. he's broken and destroyed, and, you know, she's displaying that. And that's, that's the bravery of a mother to allow that to happen, but not only that, to, to facilitate it. Facilitate it. So what about... Where you the- go, kid? Where you go? Where you go? Well, why? It's dangerous out there. It's like, yeah, no kidding. It's more dangerous here if you stay with me. By a lot. So you might lose your body out there in the world, but if you stay here, you lose your soul. How do you see that as an individual? Let's say that there isn't the mother there that's pushing you along. Well, you know, one of the things Jung 
Carl Jung uh, was very interested in the Oedipal complex, and that's basically the overprotective maternal. And he he criticized Freud for presuming that it was really something the mother did. He said it's more relational than that. First of all, it would be something the father would allow to happen, assuming there was a father around, so let's not forget about the paternal contribution to allowing that to occur. Because in some sense, it's the father's role to serve as the antithesis of that maternal overprotection. So a woman is extremely bonded with her infant, say between zero and nine months, and the infant is utterly helpless. And so complete compassion and the provision of comfort is the only job that matters. And that's really the case. And then the woman has to switch gears to some degree. The mother has to switch gears as the child starts to become more, uh, more mobile, fundamentally, and more independent. She has to let go of the infant, which is a real grieving process. And she has to start to facilitate this movement towards independence. But that's a hard shift. And so partly the role of the father in that is to be an advocate for the child's independence and to comfort the mother to let her know that that degree of security provision is no longer necessary, but also to act as an advocate for the child's outgoing, uh, outgoing desire. And so, so it's the eatable situation is not only the mother, it's also, say, the weak father, but then it's also the child. So you can imagine, because Jung believed that these negotiated agreements were, were relational, so, you know, you're six, you're in grade one, maybe you're feeling a little ill, maybe you're not, maybe you're playing with being a little ill, and maybe you're playing with exaggerating how ill you are, and your mom comes downstairs and says, you know, you've got a test today at school, maybe you haven't quite prepared for it, maybe you know you should have, and she says, but, you know, you, you seem to have a tummy ache, uh, maybe you're too sick to go to school. And the kid thinks, well, maybe I could just stay home and, you know, mom could tuck me in and I wouldn't have to take that test and I wouldn't have to confront the world. And he says, yeah, I'm like, yeah, mom, my stomach really hurts. And, and away we go. And the child has made a choice. And you think, well, that's, and that's a catastrophic choice. And you think, well, children shouldn't be held accountable for choices they make at that age. It's like, that child's soon going to be an adult that's going to make very similar decisions. The, the choice has consequences, and to be held accountable for that is to recognize purely that the choice has consequences and that it is a choice. Now, you know, you could say, well, 95% of the blame is to be put on the mother, and maybe that's an overestimate. I think it probably is. But the child could say, Mom, you don't have to worry about me. I'm going to get up and go do this. And... That's choice, and that's the right choice. So these are always chicken and egg problems, obviously, but that, that fleshes out the complexity of the situation. You know, if you're, if you're being enticed down a pathological road, you can accept or reject the invitation. Now, some people are better at enticing, and some people enforce it more harshly, and, you know, there's all sorts of individual variability in situations like this, but... Just because you're offered the bait doesn't necessarily mean that you have to take it. So, and I'm not a determinist. I do believe that people have free will, whatever that means. That's a murky subject, and it gets complicated the more you look at it, but whatever. It's still a good shorthand way of describing the fact that we seem to be cursed with responsibility for our own destiny, at least to some degree. What's happening, people? If you enjoyed that, then press here for the full, unedited episode. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.